Well, thanks. I'm, I'm Josh Gilder, and I, I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, American politics, specifically the election of Donald Trump and why it happened. Um, you know, if you just read the mainstream media in the United States, the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, watch the cable at CNN, it's very hard to get a good understanding of who Trump is and what he's about, and certainly why he was elected. I think it's even harder <coughs> when, you're, um, when, when you're in Europe. I, uh, the filters are so great. Um, it certainly was um, unexpected, especially by the pollsters and the pundits and people whose job it is to set our expectations. And it was greeted in the US and I think in much of Europe with shock, outrage, and literally tears. Um, many universities in the United States and even businesses um, took a day of mourning and even provided uh, psychological counselors to those students who were having trouble adjusting to the new uh, political reality. It's important to understand about <coughs> Trump, that this, the Trump's victory, that it wasn't really a Republican victory. The Trump campaign was more like an insurgency or even a hostile takeover that used the Republican Party as its vehicle. Um, as President Trump said in his inaugural address, this wasn't so much the transfer of power from one political party to another, but from Washington, D.C. back to the American people. So uh, what does that really mean? I think um, this is a good place to um, start with an explanation. This is the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C., and its surrounding counties. Turns out that the richest places in the United States are not Silicon Valley with all of its high-tech billionaires. It's not Los Angeles with its movie stars and other celebrities. It's not even Houston, Texas with all the oil money sloshing around there. The four richest counties in the United States are all suburbs of Washington, D.C. Loudoun County is number one right here. Fairfax, uh, Falls Church number two, Fairfax County number three, and Howard County in Maryland is number four. Of the 20 richest counties in the United States, nine, almost half, are suburbs of Washington, D.C. <coughs> I live in Washington, D.C. There's, uh, there's very little business there that isn't in some way or another directly connected to the federal government. In other words, all of this money essentially comes from tax money that's been extracted from the middle class in the rest of the country. It's not uncommon, as I said, I live there, to find yourself in Washington in a, in a um, <clears throat> to find yourself in a traffic jam surrounded by Teslas. Does everybody know what a Tesla is? Yeah. Teslas are the electric, eco-friendly status symbol made by Elon Musk that with a starting price of $100,000. Some of them go up to a quarter of a million dollars. Um, and each one of those uh, is uh, subsidized to the tune of $7,000 by middle class taxpayers. Um, the um, <clears throat> the Great Recession of 2008-2009 was barely a blip in Washington, D.C. The rest of the country may have been flat on its back economically, but Washington was doing just fine. Uh, so uh, how bad was it for the rest of the country? I've just assembled a few slides here that I think give graphically a sense of the economic um, <clears throat> cataclysm uh, that uh, has been going on in the rest of the country. The red line is employment as a ratio of, of total population. Um, as you can see, um, it's, it's been declining for some time, but literally fell off a cliff right here um, during the recession, and we, we still have not recovered those jobs. 
Um, this slide to me is particularly poignant if you can call um, slide, if you can call economic statistics poignant. This is the uh, labor force participation, uh, people who have jobs of, um, of men 40, 40 to 44 years old. These are people in the prime of their working life. As you can see, it has been a, a, a consistent slide downward for some 40 years, uninterrupted. Um, <coughs> this right here is what's known as the plight, what we call the plight of the middle class. Um, again, since the turn of the century, for the last 17 years, um, it's been a roller coaster going one direction down. In 15 years, the middle class has lost 15% of its income. This may be one reason why. Um, this is U.S. manufacturing employment from 1960. You can see that since the late 70s, it's been gradually downward, but again, absolutely fell off a cliff um, with, the great, with the Great Recession in 2008, 2009. Um, <clears throat> as conservatives like to point out, Manufacturing as a share of GDP in terms of output has not declined. That's the blue line, but the red line is manufacturing and employment. Those jobs simply are disappearing, the jobs that used to, that used to support the middle class. Um, this is a percentage of firms that are less than one year old. Um, again, in decline. In America, and I, assume, I imagine this is true everywhere else. It used to be that all new jobs were created by small and medium-sized firms. Um, a lot of this came from startups of all kinds, from mom and pop stores, um, from internet startups, from uh, to even great successes like Uber or Google. They were the great job creation. But as we can see, that that engine of job growth and opportunity is dying. This, I think, is very interesting. It's a little bit hard to decipher. There's so much on it. But the blue line, it used to be that most Americans in the country worked for small companies. Very few worked for the giant corporations, which the left thinks represent the economy. It never, it never used to. Um, the blue line is employer, um, is companies with less than 100 employees. As you can see, there used to be many more of those. Um, the yellow orangish line is companies with more than 2,500 employees. Um, again, that is the dominance of small companies has reversed. Today, more than a quarter of all employees, a quarter of all workers, work for companies with over 10,000. Um, employees. In other words, most, a quarter of all Americans work for giant corporations. Fewer and fewer work for small companies. There are fewer startups. There's um, basically the U.S. economy is becoming more corporate, less entrepreneurial, and less innovative. <clears throat> One of the big reasons for this, and there are many reasons for this, um, but I'm just focusing here on regulation. Um, is the crushing burden of regulation. As this is a, a, an entrepreneur who spoke to the Wall Street Journal, and one of the reasons for that is um, uh, if you're a small company, you, can't, you don't have the money to hire the accountants and the lawyers to negotiate your way through the tangle of regulations. But if you're a big company, you can afford it. So as one entrepreneur said, it's almost like trying to run up a mountain. The farther up you go, the bigger you get, the easier it is to move. So this is, a gra I think, graphically displays the mountain of regulation. Starting back in 1936 up to 2014. These are the number of pages in the Federal Register, which is a rough approximation of the regulatory burden on American business. <clears throat> 
So those are all economic statistics, but I think what's important, the important takeaway here is that these numbers represent real pain and suffering. This came home to me in 2015 when a, bunch of, a couple of sociologists published a, um, a bunch of dem demographers published a study showing that for the first time in American history, outside of war, um, a sizable demographic group in the United States was experiencing <laughs> declining life expectancy. Their death rate was rising. These were white men and women between the ages of 45 and 54 with less than a college degree. So they might have had some college, high school um, diplomas, but their death rate was rising. This had never happened in America before. <clears throat> the authors of the paper attributed this to what they called despair deaths. That these were, uh, this was the result of alcohol abuse, drug addiction, and suicide. In other words, what we were seeing was a massive social, economic, and cultural collapse in the country that the elites basically looked at or ignored, but if they did look at, just shrugged their shoulders because it wasn't affecting them. <clears throat> These are what, is, what Trump called the, are the forgotten men and women of the United States. These are the people who turned out in the thousands for Trump rallies all across the country. These are the people who turned traditionally blue states, democratic states in the last election, red or Republican. Um, these were the voters that made that difference. And they produced this political upset, which none of the elites predicted and which most of them still cannot accept or understand. So, <clears throat> just on the regulatory side of things, voters are certainly getting what they voted for. Um, Trump in his first, how many days is it now? Uh, 98. 98, almost like less than 100 days, has, um, has signed numerous executive orders and set other uh, regulatory reforms in motion that are going to have hundreds of billions of dollars positive effect on the U.S. economy. Uh, you wouldn't need to know, but Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, or, um, <coughs> well, Sar Sarbanes-Oxley, but also Dodd-Frank financial regulations, the Clean Power Plan, the waters of the U.S. These were, um, these were regulatory micromanagement of the uh, U.S. economy that was snuffing out jobs and snuffing out innovation and, um, and growth. Um, one of the first executive orders that Donald Trump signed was an executive order that said for every, okay, almost done, for every new regulation that was signed, two old regulations had to be removed from the books. So, okay. So this is my final slide. Um, it's just a short video, one minute. Okay. This is, um, <coughs> this is, uh, what is it? Okay, as I said, like, you know, the people who profit from the current system of high taxes and onerous regulations, the members of the permanent government in Washington, D.C., all of those who live in the very wealthy suburbs, the lawyers, the lobbyists, um, the consultant, for the people in the elitist bubbles far removed from the cultural catastrophe that I described, Donald Trump's supporters were contemptible, lower class, and embarrassingly uncouth like Donald Trump himself. President Obama <coughs> famously described them as frightened and weak, clinging to their guns and their religion. Hillary Clinton put it more forthrightly. <coughs> she, did, she called them a basket of deplorables. I don't know if that translates, but basically she was saying they were all horrible, horrible people. That's why they were voting for Donald Trump. If one word ever lost somebody in election, it was that word. <laughs> um, it summed up just how out of touch the arrog and arrogant the elites really were, and it gave incredible new energy to the Trump campaign at a time that it desperately needed it. So this is my last, uh, my last slide. I hope it works. It's, um, it's not going to work, so I'll describe it briefly. Um, basically, I don't know if anybody's seen Les Miserables. 
but they did the Trump campaign did a takeoff on that called Les De Deplorables, and they sang to the tune of Les Miserables, and it was like a massive uh, rally, and with everybody cheering and singing together um, uh, about how they were all so deplorable. So, um, and <laughs> so thank you very much.